Well, greetings again. If you would, please take and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. So I, I maybe not as much now in my, uh, in my older days, but when I was young, I always thought it would be glorious to be famous. I always thought it would be great if I was just super well known. Professional athlete was where I was leaning toward. I wasn't very good a reader. I wasn't very good at memorizing things. So being an actor was really never in it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Dan and his family are going to be gone next week with some others who are traveling to a wedding. Uh, and you'll have to listen to me sing uh, because that definitely was not the road God was leading. So a professional athlete was about the only, and I'm not very smart, so I was never going to be like a like a famous philosopher or something like that. So so athlete was the only uh, option I had, except uh, I sort of topped out at uh, at six foot, and uh, and I was never very fast, so uh, so that was never so fame was never in my in my path. But I always wanted to be famous. I thought it'd be great. I thought life would be easy. You know, people would love me and adore me, and I, like I, everything would just go super well, right? Uh, that's sort of where we find Jesus at. So Jesus has begun his public ministry. He has called disciples to himself, and we read last week how he went to the synagogue, and he began to preach, and he was preaching with such authority that the people were amazed. They were a little afraid, um, but... When you come into something as awesome as that, you're going to have a little bit of fear. That's not always a bad thing, right? Standing over the edge of the Grand Canyon, it's a little scary, but it's awesome. It's amazing, right? And so there's a little bit of fear there. And then we saw that demon-oppressed man, that man who had an unclean spirit, start speaking out, and Jesus just demolished him, cast him out, right? And so everyone was amazed by this great, great power. And so today, we're going to look at what happens after that. So if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. This is God's Word. Let us hear and obey with God's grace. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and casting out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is God's word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. So I have three points for us this morning. Number one, we're going to see Jesus' pity. Secondly, we'll see Jesus' power. And lastly, we'll see Jesus' priority. So it begins in verse 29 by saying, and immediately he left the synagogue. So that event that we just saw last week with the, with the great preaching, the great teaching with power, and the casting out of de the demon, we are in that same day, right? Uh, we are, he had left the synagogue, we're on the same Sabbath, and it says that he entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, many believe that we have actually located the house of, of Simon. And I, throughout this sermon, I'm probably going to refer to him as Peter, because that's the name he eventually is called by predominantly. But many believe we actually found the house of Peter. Uh, many archaeologists and scholars think they know exactly where it's at. And the way things happen in those older times is you would often build a house right on top of a house, right on top of a house. And so you would build a house, and then when that house started to, to, to crumble, you would just tear it down, bulldoze it over. It's not made like, you know, stick-framed houses like we have today. You would just knock it over, and then you would build a new house right on top of it. And so throughout church history, there have been this, this house that has largely been assumed to be Peter's house. And when you dig down underneath it in the city of Capernaum, you find evidence that leads people to believe that it was Peter's house. 
and it appears that uh, early in the church history, probably right after the death of Jesus, that house became a place where the church would gather and worship, and it's just a few minutes' walk away from a synagogue, an ancient synagogue. And so scholars and archaeologists think that this is probably the synagogue that he preached in, and now he's left the synagogue, he's walking to, to, uh, to Peter's home, uh, probably to have a meal after, um, after the Sabbath, uh, after the synagogue time. Synagogue time, very, very customary to us, would have ended probably around noon, right? And so when he gets there, we find that Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with, uh, with a fever, right? Now one of the things that's interesting here is we find out something about Peter, okay? We find out that Peter is a married man, and that he has a, mo um, a, a mother-in-law who lives with him, right? Peter's house, they believe, would have been large, so that multiple families could have potentially lived in this house with him. So it, it looks from this passage that Peter and his family, you have at least a wife, we don't know if there's any children, live there. Andrew, potentially his family lived there, and his mother-in-law, and, and maybe she's still married, we don't know, but she's living there, right? So you have this, this big network of people living together, well, we see that Peter was a married man, right? We also have evidence this, of this in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, where Paul says, look, we're allowed to take on wives just as all the other apostles have done, just as, as, um, as um, the brothers of Jesus, James and, uh, and Jude, they've taken wives, and even using a different name, but even Peter has taken for himself a wife. And Paul's saying, we've chosen not to do that, that we might be able to, to more faithfully um, carry out the ministry that God's called us to in those missionary journeys. But Paul is saying that there's nothing wrong with apostles taking on wives. This, this goes into stark contrast to Roman Catholic teaching that a priest has to remain unmarried. But here we see that Peter himself was a married man. And some even speculate that she was a very godly woman. Church tradition tells us that she would actually go with Peter on his missionary journeys and, and go and accompany him when he would be traveling around to different churches. Uh, and so some speculate that when um, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6 about what a godly woman looks like, that his own wife may have been an example to him, just as when the psalmist uh, writes in the Proverbs 31 woman, probably was thinking of his own mother when he was writing about that. And so here we see another evidence of an unnamed woman who yet was there to support Peter and, and help Peter uh, in, his, in his ministry. Now, uh, another thing we have to think through, though, is, is here we see that, that Peter has been called to be a, a disciple of Jesus. And that means that Peter will, will have to leave his home and presumably his wife and family um, for, for large periods of time. And so here we see another aspect of the demand of the call to ministry that was placed on Jesus' disciples. Again, we know Peter probably was not just a poor, dumb fisherman. He was probably a, a, a successful fisherman, the manager of a business in which they had hired hands working for them. It now appears that he had a large home and he has a family. Now, in the Gospels, when you're reading through this, sometimes it just looks like they're gone with Jesus for three years straight. That's probably not what we see. What we probably see is they would go on, on trips, on uh, excursions, they would travel with Jesus, but there would probably be times when they would return back to their home. And so here we can see that Peter probably would come home every once in a while during that time, but there would be this, this demand on him to, to neglect in some ways his family, the, the family life that he would have otherwise probably desired to have. But we see here a wife that seems to be supportive of that. Now his mother-in-law had a fever, right? Now, uh, oftentimes, in, in, especially there and there, we, we don't know exactly what caused all these things, but by identifying as a fever probably meant that this was her, really her only symptom, and this fever had weakened her so much that she was just laying in her bed and they could, she couldn't do anything. And so, immediately coming into the house, they told Jesus about her so that he would be able to, to help her. Now, in Mark's gospel, uh, We've only really had one real miracle up to this point, and that is the casting out of the demon, okay? But remember that Mark's gospel is being written by the perspective, from the perspective of Peter, and he's, Mark is just telling Peter's stories, all right? Uh, this is not what we call biography, right? If we were writing a biography about someone and I just skipped over some really important information, you would want to throw that away because it's just not what we expect in our modern era. But that's not Mark's purpose. And so from the other Gospels, we know that Jesus has already been performing miracles and doing things even before this episode in Mark. 
The reason Mark starts here is because he's telling the stories of Peter that Peter would have told, and it makes sense that Peter, in sharing the gospel with people and telling the stories of Jesus, would have started with a story that was so, so connected to him. It happens when it, when it appears to be in his city in Capernaum, and it happens now in what appears to be his own home. And so very similar to us, if we're talking about the greatness and glory of God, we'll often talk, connect those stories to ourselves and talking about what God's done in our lives. And so here, this is, remember, Peter's gospel being written and told uh, by Mark. And so here, they are already aware of Jesus as the miracle worker. This was not something that they were unfamiliar with. And so they believed that Jesus would have the power to heal um, their sick mother-in-law. And so he brings them to her for him, um, for him to heal her. But notice how he does it. It says he came and took her hand, took her by the hand, and lifted her up. Now, we've just seen Jesus manhandle a, a demon without even using hands, right? We, we saw Jesus just speak and the demon obeyed. And so he could have very easily just spoken and her be healed. And we'll see that in other stories in the Gospels where all he does is speak and the individual is healed. But here we see the pity of Jesus or the compassion of Jesus. That he walked over to her and he took her by her hand and that he lifted her up. We see a man who, though it has excessive amounts of power and authority and capability, yet take the time to go to a person's house to interact with a sick woman and to bring about healing to her. And that's what we see at the end of verse 31. It says the fever left her and she began to serve them. Notice here that, that when he healed her, it wasn't that the fever went away, but she was still exhausted. She still needs probably a good two or three days of bed rest to fully recover. I remember when I had COVID a couple weeks ago, my fever went away in the first week, but I was tired for weeks, right? Uh, that's normal that after, even after the fever resides, you still have this lingering effects of whatever it is that's ailing you. Not when Jesus heals you. When Jesus heals you, it's immediate so that she went from being bedridden with fever to instantaneously getting up and being well enough to serve the disciples. And so here we see Jesus' pity, his compassion, the way he cares for them. Next, in verses 32 through 34, we see Jesus' power. Okay? Now it says, That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Right? So, so we need to step back for a second and remember that the way we think of time is different from the way the Jews think of time. So when we think of a Sabbath, in our minds, unless we're really thinking through it in the in Old Testament way, when we think of the Sabbath, we probably think of Saturday morning, all the way through until Sunday morning, okay? That may be how we would think of it because that's typically how us in the West think of time, but that's not how the Jews thought of time. For the Jews, the Sabbath did not begin on Saturday morning, but the, but the Sabbath began on Friday night, and it ended on Saturday night, okay? And so it's Saturday night, you could resume. So many times Jews would have a big feast on Saturday night. We would think of that as Sabbath breaking, but for them, the Sabbath had ended when the sun went down, and they would have a big meal um, at that evening um, to, to give thanks and to celebrate the end of the Sabbath. Now, um, so what we see here is that no one was bringing sick people or people oppressed by demons to Jesus until the sun went down. And this is probably because of, an, uh, because of their interpretation of Jeremiah 17, 21 through 22. And Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord, take care for the sake of your lives and do not bear the burdens on the Sabbath day or bring it into the gates of Jerusalem and do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath or do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy, a commandment as a commandment um, as I commanded your fathers, right? And so here, if you have someone who's sick, you're going to have to support them, help carry them along. Right? And, and they wouldn't do that on the Sabbath, so they had to wait for the sun to go down. Uh, this is oftentimes what gets Jesus in trouble with the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees have a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation of what the Bible is trying to teach about Sabbath law. And so oftentimes Jesus would heal people on the Sabbath, and they would get mad at Jesus. Jesus, don't do work on the Sabbath. Just wait till the sun goes down, and then you can heal people. Okay? They had a misunderstanding. And here, these individuals appear probably to have that misunderstanding as well. They're not going to be carrying these individuals who need healing out until the sun has gone down at sundown. And now we can carry them to, to Jesus. Now, we have to remember what life was like in the first century, right? Life in the first century was different ones. They didn't have the medical treatments we have. They didn't have the sanitation that we have. 
And, and so sickness was just a much more common thing. It didn't mean that everyone died, died young. There were many, many people who lived into their 60s and 70s, but uh, many people had very sick-ridden lives um, because there was no treatment for them in, during that time. Right? And so here, you can imagine the amount of people who just found out about this, this demon being uh, exercised in the synagogue. Maybe people even started to hear what Jesus has done, done to, uh, to the woman who was ill. And so they start coming to him. It says they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. Now, one thing I think that's important here is to notice that here in Mark, there's a distinguishing uh, between sickness or illness and oppression by demons. And so I think it's helpful for us to, to have a, a balanced view of these things. Right? And so I have, I have four views that I want to go through, the last being the one I think is probably the best. Right? Uh, it, it, at one end of the, the spectrum, you have Pentecostals. And some Pentecostals, not all, but some Pentecostals think that everything is demon-related, right? If you get a cough, it's because you have a demon. If you get cancer, it's because you have a demon. If you have a headache, it's because you have a demon. If your toaster breaks on you right before you need to come to church so you can't have your morning toast, it's because you have a demon, all right? And they make demons everything, everything about demons. And so you're just constantly needing to to excommunicate demons. In the name of Christ, I command you to get out of my toaster so I can have my, my toast, right? Demons are everywhere. Anything that's bad that happens is demon. If you, if you sin, it's not your fault. It's because a demon was there. Everything's demonic, right? I, I don't think that's a good picture of what we see in the scripture. At the other side of the spectrum, you have those who would call themselves more modernist. And maybe they accept some of the miracles of the Bible, but largely they think of everything of having just natural answers. Every sort of medical condition, mental illness, all of that has, has a, a medical answer to it. There, there's either a chemical imbalance or a virus or a bacteria, something like that. Everything can be answered by medicine and science. And again, I don't think that's a great right way to go. Now, there are some who find themselves in the middle. I think they're getting closer there. And they would say that there's those natural illnesses to the body that, that we can identify, that we can understand, right? Uh, if someone's diabetic, you draw their blood, they have too much blood sugar in their blood, we know what's going on there, right? Uh, if someone has a, a tumor or cancer or something like that, if someone has a viral infection, we can, we can understand that, make sense of that. But they would say that there's those diseases, those conditions that cannot be explained by medicine, right? And they would point to things like mental illness, psychosis, uh, schizophrenia, things like that. And they would say that these are evidences of demonic oppression. And so if someone has some sort of dysphoria or some sort of uh, mental illness, that this is a demon issue. But I don't necessarily think that's a, a great way to go either, right? Because when we see the demonic come into either the presence of Jesus or into the presence of gospel preaching, usually there is a, a terrible adverse effect to that, right? People immediately stand back and say that this is, uh, that they don't want anything to do with, with gospel preaching or the name of Christ. And I think that might be a sign that there's some actual demonic activity taking place in the individual. But there are plenty of people who are just depressed and, and they're desperate for the good news of the gospel. Right? And so I think, I think a good middle ground is, is to say, that, to acknowledge that there is probably demonic activity in the world. And we shouldn't be surprised when we see individuals who are so persuaded by demonic activity that they're absolutely repulsed by the gospel and the good news of Jesus. Um, I think, just at least for me, because of my cultural upbringing, I naturally try to probably lean more towards a modernist view. I, I typically just want to think that there's probably some sort of medical solution to most of these problems. But that's not what we see in the Gospels. And so I think it's helpful for us to have a, a, a more balanced view in which we realize that there is demonic activity in the world. There is spiritual warfare taking place. Okay? And so here we see that these people are being brought, all of those who are sick and oppressed by demons are being, being brought out. And so that in verse 33, it says the whole city was gathered together at the door. Right? And so now you have all these people who are sick, all these people who are being oppressed by demons are being brought to Jesus. And, and if I was there, even if there wasn't anything wrong with me, I'd want to see it. Right? And so all of these people are going out. Again, Capernaum probably has around 1,500 people at this time. Now, when the, when the Bible uses the word all, it's sort of hyperbole. It doesn't mean every single person, but the idea is that the majority of the city is going out. 
and if you're Peter, and even if you have a, a pretty decent sized home, it'd be probably pretty intimidating to have five, six, seven, eight hundred people all of a sudden coming to your door to see this great miracle worker, this Jesus. All right? And it said that he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Now, this word many is referring to the all in verse 32. So all who came to him who were sick, he healed all of them. And notice here that he healed various diseases. All right? This is very different from those, uh, those televangelists and faith healers that you see on TV, right? You have someone with a headache and they go up and they get hit in the head, they fall down, the headache's gone, right? But the, but the paraplegic, right, or the person who doesn't have legs that work, or the person who has uh, identified cancer by a doctor, they never heal those. They walk right by them, okay? And that's because they don't actually possess the ability to heal as Jesus does, right? They only heal those selective cases that they can, uh, that anyone can sort of say uh, happen to them. And we see that Jesus heals all of the diseases. So it doesn't matter what the situation is. Doesn't matter if it's just a fever, like the mother-in-law, or if it's something more severe, Jesus was able to heal all of it. And so here we see that Jesus is, is sort of fulfilling or, or bringing to fruition uh, the psalm written about the Lord by David. In Psalm 103, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals your disease, all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, right? And so what we see here is that Jesus is sort of bringing in that which is ascribed to the Lord. He is doing that which is said to be true of the Lord. And so here we see that Jesus is, is bringing these things about. And I think what we see is is a greater fulfillment uh, of that Greek word I brought up last week, exousia, uh, meaning power or authority. It's sort of power and authority blended into one word. And so where have we seen this? So, so we see Jesus' authority and power in the fact that he was taken out into the wilderness and he withstood the temptation of the devil. Uh, next, we see that he was traveling along the Sea of Galilee. He calls out to these four fishermen and he has authority to a call disciples. So much authority that when they hear, what do they do? They immediately follow him. We see that he goes into the synagogue and he teaches with authority. He's not just giving his interpretation or his understanding uh, as I am right now, but he taught with authority because he himself was the sovereign one. Then we saw that demon come up to him, even acknowledging who he was, who he truly was, the Holy One of God. And we see Jesus' authority being demonstrated that he speaks to a demon and the demon obeys. And now... Even sicknesses, even bacteria and viruses in our own bodies that sometimes wage war against us, even Jesus has authority over that. Jesus' power and authority is unlimited. There is nothing outside of his control. But notice here at the end of verse 34 that he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Again, there's this aspect of him keeping his identity secret. That they don't, they don't fully grasp who he is because if they did, they just want to throw him up onto the, onto the throne. But that's not his purpose. That's not his mission. And so he kept them from speaking even in utterance. I can't tell you how many times I can't keep my mouth shut. How many times, five or ten minutes later, I'm like, why did I say that? Why did I say that? I need to learn to keep my mouth shut. Okay? I do it all the time. Jesus can even keep the, the mouths of utterances of demons silent, right? To just sort of put a parallel on, on how great and glorious he is in comparison to us. Now, what has happened, what has transpired on this day, right? Um, from, from the morning when he went into the synagogue and even into the late evening of this day is the way we would think of it, is absolutely amazing. And the people are significantly impressed. But what we don't see is genuine faith. Okay? These are people who, who desire to escape the, the temporal pains and the temporal sufferings of their life. But they failed to see the true spiritual warfare that was taking place as Christ wrestled with the demonic in a way. Now, he graciously healed them, 
but they did not understand why he truly came. And so we see that difficult to know how late it was, all these healings, right? Pride goes to bed late into the evening, but then he rises early in the morning, right? So now we're on a new day. He rises early in the morning before the sun has even come up, and it says he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed, okay? Having preached about the kingdom of God and having demonstrated the power of the kingdom of God in these healings and these miracles, Jesus now isolates himself. He, he pulls himself away. Now, the Greek word here for, for desolate, as the ESV has translated it, is eresmas, which in the original Greek would have been better translated wilderness or desert. But there's a problem with this. Capernaum at this time was a very well-cultivated region. And we don't see when Jesus, when Jesus leaves Peter's home, um, presumably early in the morning, we, we don't see him going on a 30-mile hike out of the region of Capernaum, the, the area that surrounded the city. That's not what we see. Right? He just goes and finds a place that's isolated. So why does Mark use a word for wilderness or desert and just in, instead of saying an isolated place? There's a Greek word for that. Why does he do that? Well, remember that the wilderness is where Jesus went after being baptized. Jesus had been baptized. That was sort of like his coronation. He'd been proclaimed to be the Son of God in power by the, by the Spirit coming down, by the voice from heaven. John the Baptist is um, heralding beforehand, right? And we would have expected, you know, at that point, Jesus to ascend to the throne. But what does he do? He goes into the wilderness to be tempted. He goes into the wilderness to be tempted. And it's in the desert that he becomes resolute, Right? We see this better described in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Luke, but there, was, there are opportunities, there are ways for Jesus to get, accomplish what he needs to accomplish other than the Father's way. Right? Jesus, you can have the whole world to yourself, the devil says. Just bow down to me. I'm the, I'm the Lord of the air. I'll surrender it to you. I'll give it all to you. But he doesn't. We see Jesus go up to the pinnacle. Just cast yourself down. The angels will come and capture you. People will love you and adore you. You do that kind of miracle and you just jump from the pinnacle of the temple and angels swoop down to catch you, you're going to be made the king of Israel. Jesus, you don't have to do it your father's way. There's other ways for you to do it. And that's what we see here. Right? What is the father's way for Jesus? The father's way for Jesus is the cross. But now... We don't need a cross, Jesus. Jesus, you've got all of these people who are clamoring to see you. You just keep healing people. You do some of the other miracles we're going to see in the book, the book of Mark. You do all these things. You don't ever have to go to the cross. You're going to be the king. You don't have to worry about it. And this is the temptation that Jesus is dealing with. Again, we, we need to understand that Jesus is a man just like us. This is the temptation to take the easy road to take the easy way. We don't have to go that hard way. We can go the easy way. So Jesus goes into the wilderness again to, to go and to make himself resolute that he will follow that he will follow the Father's plan. And notice here, remember, Jesus, as we just talked about briefly in Sunday school this week and a couple weeks ago, Jesus is God. Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. That's who he is. And we see in his baptism that the Spirit of God has come and rested upon him. And we are told in John that he has received the Spirit without measure. Okay? So he's gone in the flesh, fully possessing of the Holy Spirit. And yet, what does he do in those myths of temptation? He goes to the Father in prayer. Now, I told you back when we were in Colossians, if Paul can ask for prayer, I, by golly, can ask for prayer. Because Paul is the, the awesome apostle. And if he needed prayer, I'm sure I need it. And here we see that even Jesus, being divine in his own nature, possessing an a, 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 a infinite amount of the Holy Spirit, and yet he is one who goes to the Father in prayer. He needs prayer. He needs that support. Now we can assume, right? Jesus has left early in the morning. 
Sun is starting to come up, and what is everyone doing? Everyone is coming out to see Jesus again. We saw everything last night. What are we going to see today? Yesterday, we just saw demons being cast out after cast out after cast out. All these people who have been sick. We're ready to see Jesus. You can just imagine people lining up the door, knocking. Peter, wake up, wake up. The sun's up. Come out, come out. We want to see Jesus. But Jesus is nowhere to be found. And so it says that Simon and those who were with him, presumably uh, Andrew and James and John, maybe even some others, went searching for him. And they found him. In verse 37, they found him. And they said, everyone is looking for you. All right? Uh, the idea here is that they, they're saying is, what are you doing here, Jesus? Why are you out here? Everyone's looking for you. Everyone wants to see you. Isn't this what you called us to? You called us to be fishers of men. The nets are full. They're all in my house waiting on you. Let's go. And you can then again see that temptation in Jesus, right? I mean, don't we all want to be wanted? Don't we all want to be liked and adored and loved and admired? And this is what Jesus has. Jesus has a whole bunch of people, an entire city that just wants him. Everybody is waiting for you, Jesus. Let's go. Everything you want is here. So we see this temptation again. But notice what he says. He doesn't say, yeah, let's go. What does he say? And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. Now Jesus' proclamation and power is so powerful that it calls for decision because what we see is the kingdom of God crashing into the kingdom of the world, right? And we see this in the preaching with authority, but we see it powerfully demonstrated by these signs, as John would call it, but by these miracles, right? How do we know that the kingdom of God is crashing into the world? Because demon-oppressed people are having their demons cast out. How do we know that the kingdom of God is crashing in? Because people with diseases are being healed. And this is evidence that the kingdom of God is crashing into the world and bringing about the salvation that these people had hoped for. This is glorious, right? But what we see is that the people of Capernaum did not have the right response. They did not have the response of repentance. They had the response of attraction. They were attracted to the power and the glory of Jesus in these healings, but they were failing to recognize what he was truly doing. And that was preaching the gospel of God and calling for repentance because the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they failed to understand what Jesus was ultimately calling them to. And I think this is important for us, that there is this essential nature of repentance in salvation. And I think this is an area where we have to be careful as a church, both individually and corporately. Because we are calling people to Christ. But if we call people to Christ without repentance, it's a false call, right? It's especially significant for me standing behind the pulpit because I, I sort of stand as the representative for our church. But it'd be easy to preach a lovely message about Jesus dying for sinners and, and the grace he gives and how kind and generous he is. But it's not coupled with a call to repent of your sin, to surrender your whole life to Christ. It is in vain. And this is the, the faith that we see in Capernaum. They are attracted to Jesus. They are willing to believe certain things about Jesus. But what we don't see is this, this, this repentance, this change of life in them. And so here we see that these, these, ministries, these, these signs these healings and these casting outs, the purpose of them is to validate Jesus' preaching, that they might repent. And having seen this, this lack of repentance in Capernaum, though there's this great evidence of signs, Jesus decides it's time to go somewhere else. And he says that I may preach there also, in the verse 38, for this is why I came out. And I think what Jesus does, he has a play on words here, Okay. He's saying, this is why I came out of Capernaum. This is why I left the city, right? I, I've left the area where, where you were at. I've come to this, this desolate, this isolated place because I don't want to be there anymore, right? I, I, I've preached there. I've demonstrated my power there. They're not repenting. 
And now it's time for me to go to another city. This is, the reason I came out of Capernaum was that I might go to other towns and preach. But I also think there's this idea that this is why he came out of heaven. The purpose of Jesus coming out of heaven is that he might bring about the gospel of God, which leads to repentance. During his earthly ministry, you see what he's preaching. He's preaching a message of repentance. You go to the Sermon on the Mount. I always say, I don't know when I got saved. I don't know when God did that in my heart. It was a process of time. All I know is that by the time I got to the Sermon on the Mount and I heard the preaching of Jesus, I had a changed life. I repented. There were things in my life that I had to stop because I believed the gospel. And so this is what Jesus' earthly ministry was about. It's about bringing about repentance. Ultimately, it goes to the cross where repentance is made possible and salvation is made possible. But he came to preach the gospel of repentance. Because repentance is absolutely essential for salvation. And so he came out of Galilee, or he came out of Capernaum to do this, to go to other towns. He came out of heaven to do this. And it says that he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And so when he was given this opportunity to forego his mission, when he could be exalted to, to, to great honor just by the, the demonstration of the miracles that he performed, Jesus didn't choose the easy way. Jesus chose the way of his Father. And I think for us, both as a church and individual, individually, we have to make sure that our priorities are straight. What is it that God is calling us to? Many churches have gone the direction to be a, a, a social welfare sort of institution where their whole purpose is to, to do things to, to physically bless others. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that can only be an aspect of the church's ministry. The church's ultimate ministry is to proclaim the gospel of God, which leads to faith and repentance. And, and then God has called us individually to a number of different things. You, you are part of this church. So if it's a, a function of this church, it's your function as well. But some of you have been called to parents, right? I mean, parenting is one of those things that you can either take the easy way or the hard way. The easy way of just letting your kids do what they want, not fighting, not arguing with them, or the hard way of disciplining them, training them. Some of you are children, and you have the, you're called to, to submit to your parents. There's an easy way and a hard way. Some of you are employees. Some of you are employers. Some of you are retired. Some of you have specific vocations. What is God calling you to, and are you going to choose the easy way or the hard way? Are you going to go the way that, that God has called you to, or will you take an easy way? And so here I think Jesus stands as, as an example to us, that Jesus knew the will of the Father. And even when there were plenty of opportunities for him to gain what he was moving towards and then the idea of being crowned as the king, there was all these ways for him to accomplish that without suffering on the cross. And yet Jesus never gave in to that temptation. And may we be those who do the same. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, for your gloriousness and your goodness. Father, we thank you for the example of Jesus. That when he had all of the praise of men, a whole city ready to, to love and adore him, he did not succumb to, to the temptation, to the idol of, of flattery and adoration, false adoration, but knew that the will of his father was to preach repentance and ultimately to die on a cross. So, Father, whatever it is that you've called us to, might we, in the, in the same way, through the power of your Holy Spirit, live out a life of faithfulness to you. So God, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins by the accomplishments of Christ and that you would be gracious enough to use us in your great kingdom work. God, we thank you for your glory. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.